If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Welcome to The Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck. We're here with Robin Beck. Robin Beck is a woman who was actively involved in the gay community for 35 years. She's an author, she's a writer, and she's a tremendous witness, and I think a real gift to the church in our time to, to represent for us, really from the inside, an understanding of both God's plan for all of us, but also God's plan for gay people. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, Robin, tell us a little bit just about your story. Well, the funniest thing happened six years ago this past, or five years ago this past Ash Wednesday. I was invited to receive ashes, go to a Catholic church by a woman I was interested in, and I was so enamored with her I'd have gone anywhere. So, okay, we'll go get ashes, and I thought I'll grab my ashes and get out of there, because me Catholic, no way. So you were not Catholic, oh, but no. you're just a friend. V okay. Yeah, yeah, and God just hooked my heart that afternoon. I was there for an hour just in awe of what was playing out before my eyes. And so my friend said, do you want to come to Mass on Sunday? It's like, oh yeah, I'll come to Mass. Because I needed to know if this afternoon was for real. And I walked in and again, I was just taken in by I think the structure, which is something I so desperately needed by the reverence and by the unity I felt amongst all the other folks there. And that was it, Peter, I never left. <laughs> Now, did you know, did you grow up with any Christian background at all? Oh or? yeah, I grew up a Baptist. Okay. And I received Christ when I was ten years old, and it was it was real. Mm -hmm. And when I was nineteen, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the Word of God Community in Ann Arbor. Oh my! Yeah. And I was on fire for Christ. And shortly thereafter, I had my first relationship, and for years, it's like, Lord, how could that happen? So could, what, what do you mean? Explain to us you, your first relationship, your first gay relationship. Yes. Yeah. Now, how, how did that door, having been raised Christian, baptized, how did that door open for you in, in looking well, back on all that? I think because, first of all, I was very wounded. I grew up with a drinking mother, bless her heart. She could not emotionally connect with her kids, and, and, and she was abusive. I grew up with a dad who was abusive made me very frightened of men. So I had like this double whammy going on. I'm desperately needing the love of a woman and I'm scared to death of men. So this woman I got involved with, we both got the baptism of the Holy Spirit the same night and we became very emotionally enmeshed and one thing led to another and we crossed the line. But we knew it was sin and for most of our relationship, which was long distance, we would just cry and say, we're going to hell. I mean, you know, and finally she ended it after about eight months, and I was devastated. But I did what I always did. I ran to God, I ran to church. That summer I got my act back together, and I decided that the answer was, I'm going to Bible college. That'll fix me. Hmm. So I ran away. And where'd you go to Bible college? I went to Bible college in Minneapolis to an Assembly of God Bible College, very conservative, and I got involved with one of my instructors. Hmm. And then I went to a therapist because it's like, okay, there's something seriously wrong with me. And uh, he broke confidence on me, told the school, and then it was just a big nightmare from then on out. And it became very dark and, mm -hmm. and very sad. And I, I wanted to be part of the church, but I just felt so rejected. See, back then, we've almost done like this complete 180 where now we're so loving and so accepting. And even as Christians, oh, that's nice. These gay people are so nice. Let's just love them and they're fine the way they are. But back then, it was brutal. I mean, if you told anybody you were struggling with this, they basically said, well, then you have to leave the church. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There just was no place. 
And so you know. some, of, some of what you hear of the pain of rejection is very, very Absolutely. real. Absolutely, and I think that's triggered a lot of the anger of a lot of people these days. I mean, there are a lot of people who are in the gay lifestyle who consider themselves evangelical Christians, but they're wounded, they're angry because they're my age, I'm 59, when they were coming out, I mean, there was no compassion, there was no love, there was no anything except judgment and rejection. Yeah. And so some of the conclusion that people come to to say, boy, there, there seems to be a kind of special dislike for us, almost a hatred because of the particular cross or whatever we, we bear. We bring it out in the, in the community and we're like lepers and no one wants to get near to us. Mm -hmm. So that, that really has been the experience for some people. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And that was, was, that was your experience. That was what my you're experience. Saying. So what happened then? What? Well, I have always known truth. There's a part of me that always knew that the truth was in scripture. And so I would go to conservative churches because I wanted the gospel. Mm -hmm. But then they'd mention homosexuality being sin. It's like, okay, I'm out of here. And then I'd go to some nice liberal church or I did new age. I mean, I can't tell you all the churches I did. But at that point you were, you were, as they say, come out and you were embracing it you were, you were embracing I, it wholeheartedly or going back and I fought it for eight years. I, I fought it for eight years. And then I read a book when I was 28 by two evangelical women called Is the Homosexual My Neighbor? And they basically concluded that God was okay with a loving, monogamous, committed gay relationship. And about that time, I, I hooked up with a group called Evangelicals Concerned, which was a group of gay evangelicals. And so it's like, okay, I'm going with this. And then I, I, that's when I finally came out to God it's like, God, I'm a Christian, and oh, by the way, I'm gay. Yeah. And just tried to tell myself. So then how did that change your life? What, what, how did it change your daily life? How did it change your public identity? How did it change? What did you do to kind of go after it I wholeheartedly started, then? I started to tell my friends hmm. I was gay. Um, and I was in a relationship, and she was having a hard time accepting who she was as a gay person. So we decided, well, we'll move somewhere new and that will help us. But you know, wherever you go, there you are. And um, the relationship just didn't work because she could never deal with it. And we were together for four years. And so I just finally decided I'm gonna find somebody that can accept their, their gayness and go with them. And so I did. So you thought you were in a healthy place. She was oh, not. Oh, yeah, no, no. She, she was, was not in a healthy place. No, I so was you the needed to find one, somebody yeah. who was courageous exactly. and integrated enough yes, and, absolutely. and confident about their identity that yeah. we're going to. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I did. I yeah. went with that person. And from there on out, I strung together a whole bunch of relationships that none of them lasted more than eight months. Is that is that peculiar? Is that typical or what? in terms of the relationship to relationship? 60% of lesbian women will have 10 or more relationships in their lifetime. And only 7% of gay people have a relationship that lasts for longer than three years. So I was a little better than most. I had 12 relationships. So I mean, those are dramatic statistics. And they, e even though there's issues in the heterosexual community, clearly there's divorces. and the statistics don't even come close to this. No. Um, and, and we're not saying it to, because we want to be hard on people, it's just a fact. It's fact. So what, what's the root of that fact? Why is it happening? What, why one relationship after another after another, Robin? What's the story there? Well, I think it's brokenness, Peter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was so broken and so wounded, and my answer to fix myself was to have a woman love me. But it's like the lie with alcoholism or gambling addiction, you know. It's like it's an addiction. It's a sickness. And any time you're looking for anything other than the Lord Jesus to fix and heal your life, you're just in for a real bad trip. Now, the, of the, thanks for sharing that, by the way, being honest about it. The, the 12 relationships you had, how many of the women had similar backgrounds or the same sense of woundedness in some way that you're experiencing and, and being drawn to you for those very same reasons? I think every single one of them. Hmm. Every single one of them. And I did a lot of 12-step groups, did 10 years of 12-step groups, and I always had to s seek out the gay groups. because. Yeah. Um, and you talk about the woundedness and, and, and the relationship changing. <laughs> You could just sit there and know that, well, so-and-so has been in this relationship for six months. It's going to end soon. Sure enough, yeah. a couple weeks later, oh, it's over. Now, now, people will say often, Robin, that the, re yes, woundedness for sure. But the woundedness is the result of 
homophobic and bigoted people, that the reason people are wounded is not because they have a homosexual orientation right. in their life, but it's because people have been so mean to them and have been so hard on them. That's the reason. Yeah. Interesting, Peter. Denmark did a study. Denmark, one of the most accepting countries in the world of homosexual persons. And they did a survey of people in this lifestyle, and they found high rates of mental illness, of depression, of um, uh, social issues. I mean, large, large amounts of these folks. So I think that kind of debunks that argument. Yeah, I, I saw a similar study in Am that was done, I think, in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. where, uh, again, a really welcoming community over a long period of time and the same kind of data was there to say, look, this was an optimal environment where there was, there was certain, certain, in some ways honored, in some ways specially recognized mm -hmm. for many years, and that uh, it had the same effects overall. And so are we going back then? What that basically says, we're going back to something deeper, personal, a wounding, something internal. It's not an external thing that's the cause of that woundedness and pain. It's something internal. Yeah, it is, because when it's your remedy of how I'm going to fill the hole, yeah. the hole that only God can fill. It's interesting, Romans 1 said, when it's talking about homosexual relationships, they worshiped the creature more than the creator. And that's what you do. It's like, I'm going to look to this person who's going to bring me the happiness I so long for, rather than the Lord. Yeah, that's a really powerful, I think almost prophetic passage that Absolutely. really does characterize much of our time. But it's the, uh, Pope Benedict said at one point, this is the constant human struggle. And the fundamental issue there was the suppression of the truth about God. Exactly. And God's, and refusal to acknowledge God as God and to give him thanks. And so we, the sin of idolatry is present in the human heart, that battle, that temptation for that to say, I'm God, or I'm only going to be safe if I'm in control. And if I, I don't want to acknowledge God or have to live a different way of life, and then God gives us over to the life we choose mm -hmm. and the consequences. And one of the first things he describes is that men started having desire for men, women for women, and then he lists a whole set of other, exactly. other sins. So it's not like this is the only right. sin, but it's interesting that Paul highlights it. Why do you think that? Why, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I know it's the only one we have a parade for. Yeah. That's, that's the scary part. Yeah. We're not seeing it as a sin anymore. We're just seeing it as something to celebrate. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know of a lot of other sins that we're really all excited about. Yeah, and I, th I think the, the part, of what, part of what's happening there with Paul, we're kind of celebrating idolatry. And that's exactly. really what it is. Just like if I'm caught in adultery, if I'm caught in fornication, it's a f these are forms of idolatry right. and infidelity to the right. Lord. And, and if we suppress the truth about God, we just pretend he's not there, we ignore him, then one of the consequences of that is we lose sight of the design, uh, we lose sight of our own nature. Exactly. We, when we lose the ground of nature, which is God, when we deny that, we lose the capacity to recognize our own nature mm -hmm. and how we're put together. Right. Yeah. Now, did you take any, uh, let's talk about, you know, you went into church that day. Did you literally get surprised as it were and slapped shocked. I, yeah, shocked. shocked because I walked in I thought oh these Catholics are crazy they're pagans so they're gonna fly in slap on ashes and run out the door and peel rubber on the way out of the parking lot and I just sat there and I watched person after person family after family come in and with loving reverence receive ashes and then these people would sit down and pray and it's like whoa you know yeah Catholic seriously and I was so blown away yeah I had to come to mass yeah. I had to check out yeah. So w the transition for you then, as you were starting to be drawn into the Catholic Church, and then what really caused you to look at your lifestyle and yourself, your identity at that time, and what really brought the change? Well, there were two things. It was six months before I would finally say, God, you're right, I'm wrong. But during those six months of being at Mass, there's big old Jesus up on the crucifix, and I knew the truth. I mean, I grew up knowing the truth. I knew scripture, but I had just twisted. And so there's Jesus dealing with me for six months. And in the meantime, I'm getting involved in one more relationship with this Catholic woman. And then the bottom dropped out um, in September. And I'd already signed up for RCIA mm -hmm. in August, still unresolved. 
But knowing there were Catholics who were in the church who were homosexual and who could have their cake and eat it too, so it's like, well, why not me, God, you know? And when the bottom dropped out, and it was interesting, it was on my 54th birthday, and I got on my knees that day and I said, God, you're right, I'm wrong, I am done. And that was it. It's been five years. Wow, yeah. wow. And, and were you at the time when you said you're looking up at the cross, what were you seeing and hearing? What was the Lord saying to you? Were you, were you reading things like the theology of the body or were you, what was happening Nothing. that you were- I wasn't reading anything. Yeah. It was Jesus just kind of saying, you know. You know the you truth. Know the you truth. know the truth. Yeah. And you're willing to take a look at that honestly in your life. And you, the Lord was gradually giving you the strength. What was the source of the strength? Do you think it was just your relationship with the Lord? The grace of God was allowing you to be honest? I think so, but I think it was also just this presence I felt of God when I came to Mass mm. and the reverence. It was serious. You know, I, st I still will go to Protestant churches because I just love 45-minute hom homilies, but yeah. they call them sermons. But it always bothers me that everybody's just in there yakking and having fun. It's like, well, wait, no, wait, be quiet. I need to connect with the Lord. And that's my special time with Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he was just working on me. Yeah. And, but it's funny, after I repented, Peter, I knew that it was about a lot more for me than just being chased. God wanted to clean up the inside. Hmm. And I was, we, the person I was getting involved with, we said, okay, we can't go here, but we'll be friends. But it was so emotionally murky. And that went on for 10 months, 10 months of big time drama. And it's finally, you know what, this is not glorifying to the Lord. I mean, she wanted to have a romantic friendship. And I'm going, how does that work? I mean, that's like putting cocaine on the table and say, we're just gonna look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew that I needed to be transformed inside because along with, you know, my homosexual tendencies, I had a lot of gender identity disorder going on inside of me too. What does that mean, gender identity I disorder? I was extremely identified with being masculine. I thought of myself as just big and tough. My clothing was all masculine. It's only been in the last six months I've started to wear skirts again. And that is just a tremendous transformation. I love the color pink. Mm. Um, and as I've healed and reconnected, talking about reconnecting with the way God designed me, reconnected with my feminine side, I really have grown to love my brothers in Christ. And I see the beauty of marriage. And I have this strong desire in me for having the protection, the spiritual pr uh, protection of a man. And I think God made women that way. Mm. And we're just obliterating that. It's like, yeah. oh no. You're saying, just saying gender identity disorder. Um, what's the, what's the root, root of that, do you think, in your case? Like, what's the cause of it? And why did it express itself, that wound, why did it express itself that way? I've talked to other women who have been, had fathers who were abusive, and I think that's a shield. Okay. It's like you have to just then get tough. You've got to, no, yeah. no one's going to take care of you. You're going to, you're going to. Especially yeah. for those of us who watched our mothers be abused. Yeah. It's like, I'm not going there. That ain't going to be me. So you just start okay. to take on the masculine strength. The other sad part for me is when my father left, because I was already a bit of a tomboy, yeah. my mom put on me all my dad's jobs. And then my masculine identity became enhanced. Mm -hmm. I really got the guy thing going on. Yeah. Now, the, uh, one of the things is you talk about gender identity. You know, this past year, Facebook shifted from, you know, identifying yourself as male and female to like 50, 50, 58. Okay, 58 yeah. options. And yeah. I, th this, is a, this is a really big deal yeah. when, when they did it. I mean, this did, yeah. Facebook is massive. It's yeah. huge. And it's a kind of catechetical tool for young people, you know, in the sense of they're being taught to say what's normal is that there's this whole list of possibilities yeah. and that you should just at different times in your life choose whatever identity you think best fits you at a particular time. And it's fluid and it could be this one time, it could be this another time, it could be this at a different time. And what, what are your thoughts on that? You know that? <laughs> that was the day I quit Facebook, Peter. Okay. I deleted my account. I said, this is too crazy. Yeah. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. It, it is. It, God made two genders, male and female. 
and he gave us distinctions. I'm telling you, this is another reason that gay relationships don't work. It's because there's no definitions of who people are. Yeah. I mean, God knew what he was doing when he made us. Yeah. And he gave us scripture to help us figure it out, just like my car came with the owner's manual. If I decide one day my car is a boat, it ain't gonna work well. Yeah. You know. You made me think, uh, you know, John Paul's teaching on the theology of the body is such a gift mm -hmm. for the life of the church, really for the, for the world, I think, at some Absolutely. point as it gets unpacked. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that's being suppressed, that we talk about the suppression of the truth, is the, what he calls the language of the body. You know, that, are, that we're made in a particular way, to have our bodies are constituted in a particular way. It's a part of who we are, part of the self. And I've had conversations with, with you know, homosexually attracted people or friends of mine and different things. And they say, I said, why, why do you identify with that particular lifestyle? And when it comes right down to it, you know, someone would say to me, you know, because I'm being true to myself. And I'd say, okay, well, what's yourself? And they'd say, well, at the end of the day, myself is my feelings. And I say, well, <laughs> is, your, is your body part of yourself? I mean, you've never existed anywhere in the world ever apart from your body. So is your body part of your identity, part of who you are? And so why? So well, because your body's constituted in a particular way. And when that body corresponds to a body that's complementary to it, there's a unity and a union that can happen that life can come forward. But if it's the same mirror image of you, there's no possibility of the bodily union that can lead to family life, which is what sexuality is for. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. ultimately what it's for. It's for babies and bonding, as, as they mm -hmm. say, as Janet, uh, Dr. Janet Smith often says, you know. Mm -hmm. So now, do you, would you say, Robin, that uh, people talk about the nature nurture question and people are trying to say, well, there's, there's got to be a gene there. There's got to be a, a causal thing they're born with. Wh what's your opinion? And can people actually come out of this life lifestyle successfully? I mean, you're a living witness. What are your thoughts to people who come to you and ask you about it? Yeah, there, you're right. There's no conclusive study that there's a gay gene. I'm a big believer in its nurture. And for those that say, well, I've always felt this way. Well, there's a whole lot of things that can happen in the first couple years of your life before you're really having memories of, you know, um, the way you relate to your mom and your dad. There's things that happen to us when we're in the womb. They're finding that more and more. And I totally believe God heals. When I left five years ago, I had no idea what God was going to do in my life. But any time a friend of mine suggested there's a group that will pray for you, there's this ministry, there's that, I said yes. And, and the other big thing I did, Peter, is I just started to cleanse my life of anything that was toxic, anything that would put thoughts in my head that were not going to lead me to a deeper life with Christ. I have no television. I got rid of music. I got rid of DVDs, anything with fornication in it, no matter how much I love that movie, West Side Story, Somewhere in Time, they're gone because I want to be well. And scripture says, I love this verse in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's very powerful. Thank you so much, Robin. And we're just going to take a break for a minute. We're going to offer, Ralph wrote a new booklet called The Final Confrontation. We'd like to offer to all of you who are listening to the program. It's, it's a powerful, uh, really, insight into what the Lord is doing in our time. We'll be back in just a minute. Shortly before John Paul II was elected Pope, he gave this prophetic warning while on a visit to the United States. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This prophetic warning was repeated recently by the papal nuncio to the United States as he spoke to all the American bishops. And whether this is the final confrontation or not, we're certainly living in the midst of a tremendous confrontation. In this booklet, I consider what we can learn from scripture about this confrontation and how we can live during it and emerge victorious. To receive your free copy, visit our website at renewalministries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. I think you'll find the booklet I've written very helpful. Welcome back to The Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck, and I'm here with Robin Beck, who's been sharing with us really the powerful story of her journey and coming to terms with uh, 
a lifestyle choice she had made. She was homosexually oriented much of her life, 35 years lived in the, lived the gay lifestyle. And really by God's grace, by walking into a church one day on Ash Wednesday, not even Catholic, but invited by a friend, uh, the Lord surprised you and uh, right, tricked you, right, he tricked you. Yeah, you <laughs> fell in love with the Lord and you found his peace and his presence there in the church and ended up going through RCIA and entering the Catholic church and, and having the strength to be able to come out of the lifestyle to see it for what it is. Now, I know there are some of our listeners, um, Robin, will be asking, may have children, relatives, or somebody who's begun to identify with the lifestyle or might just be struggling with it because they're living in a world that says, you know, choose your own identity, choose your own gender, choose your own lifestyle. What kind of counsel would you give to parents or others in that kind of situation to help them? Well, the biggest thing is remain truthful to Scripture and the teachings of the truth. It's going to be such a temptation because this is your child and they're saying, this is who I am, I want to be happy. And of course, we want our kids to be happy. But it's not a happy life. They don't know that, but you have to be the one that's going to hold the line and just keep telling them the truth, but in love, yeah. in kindness. Accept who they are, affirm who they are as your child, but not the behavior. Yeah. And as far as giving you the daily how to relate to my kid, what to do about this, what to do about that, you just got to go to Jesus. This is going to be something that's going to keep you on your knees seeking the Lord and asking the Holy Spirit, what do I do now? Yeah. You know? And you can trust the Lord's presence, the Lord's Absolutely. power, the Lord's grace, because the Lord will give you the grace you need. And just like it happens as a father, my own family, my wife and, my wife and I, and for other issues, every parent has to guide their child. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you feel like you're over your head and sometimes you feel like it's too much and you need God's grace. And Debbie and I, after raising four kids, can say we've had so much help in the face of our weakness and feeling at times like we don't know what to do. The Holy Spirit really has helped us. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit loves your child, right? The Holy Spirit loves, loves to help us become what God wants us to be. Mm -hmm. So, Robin, it's been really a delight to have you here in the program. I want to uh, thank you for your courage. I want to honor you for the choices that you're making and leaning on the Lord and standing in the truth. It takes great courage to do that in our day. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Friends, for all of us, we need to remember it's the truth that sets us free. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. And the only way to happiness for everybody ultimately is to find their identity in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the way to happiness. He's the truth about happiness and fulfillment. It's the Lord himself. And he's so close to us in his Holy Spirit. He wants to give us all we need to be able to live in freedom. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.